Take your Bibles tonight and turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 tonight, and we're going to look at verse 6. Good to see your smiling face tonight, and I trust that you had a good afternoon. Looking forward to what God has for us tonight. Hebrews 11, and let's look at verse number 6 together. God gave us great uh, service this morning, and uh, appreciate uh, all that uh, you did to make that possible, and uh, so thankful for you. It's good to see Brother Bill this morning, wasn't it? And to just see God's grace and God's faithfulness. Pray for him. I believe he's taking his grandson back uh, to college uh, late this afternoon, early evening. And uh, many of you ladies are helping out with meals beginning this week and encourage you to uh, do your best in that, to be an encouragement to him. And uh, many other things God did in our midst today and so grateful for it. And look forward to what God has for us tonight. Hebrews 11, let's look at verse 6 together. And then we'll have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Ask the Lord to bless our time. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a, notice this next word, rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And tonight we want to wrap up some thoughts in uh, this area of stewardship. We've been looking at principles of stewardship, and tonight I want to look at two that involve motivation, and I hope tonight God will work in your heart as he has mine. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the joy it is to be in your house tonight. Lord, we're thrilled to experience your grace and strength and comfort in these last few days that we've shared together as a church. And Lord, to know that you are able and uh, you're sufficient. And uh, Lord, just how you've proven yourself in our lives. And we're so grateful for that. Father, I pray tonight as we gather that, God, you would just uh, have free course in our hearts, that your spirit would uh, be able to move and to work in each of our hearts. I pray that your word, Lord, would find um, open hearts and minds tonight, Lord, that it might uh, deposit your truth, it might transform us into being more like your Son. And Lord, may we sense tonight the epic importance of our stewardship, not just in light of these few years we share upon this earth, but in light of eternity. Move in the hearts of each of us, including our young people tonight, Lord, that we might give ourselves to you we might use each and every aspect of our being and our life and our resources to give to that which is of eternal value and significance. Bless our study tonight, we pray. Increase our motivation as we steward for you. In Christ's name, amen. I don't know if uh, you have felt extra energized by the cold weather we have had. I think, if anything, we go the opposite direction, don't we? I saw the other day someone said this, have you caught yourself deciding between sitting down and doing nothing or laying down and doing nothing? And that's by about four o'clock until maybe the last few weeks, now it's light till what, 6.15, you know? And, and, uh, but just the early darkness and the cold and you just, you just wanna sit down and sleep or lay down and sleep, either way you're not gonna get much done. And many times we lack motivation. Can I encourage you tonight my heart is this, I believe this with all my heart, I think some of the most important months of a believer's life and some of the most important months of a church's life are the winter months. I think many times if we're not careful, we kind of disengage and we just hunker down and we just wait for warmer weather. And in our climate and in our part of the world, I believe that's where really the difference is made between a casual, kind of just marginal type of faith and ministry and those that persevere for the Lord. Proverbs 20 verse 4 says this, The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold, therefore he shall beg and harvest and have nothing. It, there's, just, there's times we need to be about God's work, and that includes this time of winter season. And I want to encourage you tonight to stay motivated, stay engaged in what God has entrusted to you. God has created us with certain desires and made us to be motivated by rewards. We see that here in verse 6 of Hebrews 11, that we must believe that God rewards those who earnestly seek Him. And I have found this, and I hope you've caught this thrust the last couple of Sunday nights. Some view doing something for God with part of our motivation being rewarded, that that's somehow like a mercenary, that it's just okay, God, you said this, and so I'll do this, and it's a very cold just kind of uh, transaction. And yet we reward our kids, don't we? What we offer incentive is, and we offer encouragement to those that are a blessing to us, and God does the same for us. And so may we tonight be motivated properly by those rewards. Now tonight what I want to give you, and we're going to look at a couple of texts tonight in this area of motivation, 
But the last two principles tonight in our series are this. First of all, number one, that we are to give of ourselves with a hearty motivation. A hearty motivation. Not a huge fan of some of what he stood for, but Steve Jobs, who is well known in the tech world, once made a statement. He said this, the only way to do great work is to love what you do. And there's something about when our heart is in it that naturally the product is better, the stewardship is better, the impact of what we do for the Lord is of greater importance. And what the devil tries to do is to discount or to try to shame us into not striving for the very rewards that God has promised us. God says, here's a reward, and then our flesh and our logic and sometimes even well-meaning believers encourage us not to strive for and not to be motivated by those rewards. Now, I want to look at tonight two things that I think will help us in this area. First of all, number one, we need to look within ourselves for where there is indifference, where there is a casual, flippant, maybe just blasé approach to serving and honoring the Lord. Would you go to the book of 2 Corinthians? And I want to give you just a couple of verses found in chapter 9 tonight that I think would confront our indifference. It would challenge us to re-engage where we have idled, and maybe for the first time some of us engage in properly stewarding our lives and everything we have and are for the Lord's glory and honor. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I'm sorry, I said 2, didn't I? 2 Corinthians 9, and if you will, look at verse 7. Just one verse here in this area of a hearty motivation. God says this in verse number 7 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, every man, notice, according as he purposeth in his, what's the next word? Heart. So let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And here's the truth I would give you tonight. And I, if you don't write anything else down, I would write this down or, you know, if you need later, I can email it to you. But here's the statement that I would give you that has changed my life in recent years in the area of stewardship. Here it is. The missing ingredient in the lives of many Christians is motivation. The missing ingredient in many Christian lives is motivation. It, it's just we don't realize the why. We don't realize how important and how vital and how rewarding it is to do God's thing His way until He comes for us. The missing ingredient in the lives of many Christians is motivation. And I can see why in some ways that is true. We, you know, we have teaching now where we all just end up in the same place and really whatever we do in this life has no bearing on the eternal uh, state, our condition in it, others. But as I was trying to stress this morning, why are we getting ready to plant a church? Because there are people who need to hear the gospel that won't hear the gospel if there's not a church there. Why are we trying to grow this church? Because there are families, there's discipleship, there's evangelism, there's other ministries that are rattling around in a lot of our heads that need to be done for the Lord. But, but if we don't believe that's going to make any difference, then why would we be motivated? You can do something that will have lasting impact and value. And so can I. And so we have to look at the indifference. We have to be honest about it, and we have to allow God to replace that with motivation. The doctrine of eternal rewards for our obedience is the neglected key to unlocking our motivation. If you'll get a heart, hold of the fact God said, I want to reward you doing right, man, that reengages our passion. It gives us back, or for the first time, the motivation that we see in so many early Christians. I read the Scriptures, and I see people highly motivated. And then I look at my own apathy, and often I wonder, where, where's the missing link? Am I not persecuted enough? Did, do I have too much things in my life? And it's just it's the modern age, and we have all this, and it's just on a downhill spiral. Or is there something in me missing, something that was in them that I yet lack? Now, go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I got ahead of myself. And let me give you the example of Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, all right, we were in 2 Corinthians 9. Go back down to the first letter to the church at Corinth. And look, if you will, at the last few verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And you tell me if there's not a difference between the mindset of Paul and often where you and I live. 1 Corinthians 9, look, if you will, at verse 24. Paul says this, Know ye not that they which run a race run all but one receive at the prize, so run that ye may obtain... We touched on a little bit of this last week. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I right, remember we talked about the incorruptible crown and that this crown of incorruption is the result of discipline and structure in our daily walk with the Lord. Notice how Paul implemented 
what he needed to be able to receive this reward. He says, I therefore, in light of the truth he has just given, so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. There was a focus, there was a drive to Paul. And what was that drive? What was that motivation? It wasn't just his love for Christ. It was the rewards that God had promised him he wanted to achieve, he wanted to receive for God's glory and honor. We cannot excuse our apathetic view of stewardship when we look at the Scripture, the countless passages that say we should be motivated by that which God has promised us. Here's something I'd encourage you to do. And as I'm looking at you tonight, all right, you struggle with apathy? I do. Even in church tonight, man, I've been in, th- I've been in thousands of church services. I've preached hundreds and hundreds of sermons. Can I challenge you where you lack motivation tonight? Start reading the promises connected to being motivated and let those things fuel you and, and, and give you that fire back in your belly and heart that you need to make a difference for the Lord. I think if we can meet early Christians, many of us would be like, whoa, calm down a little bit. That, that would be our response. If we met Paul, if we met some of the early believers, where's the passion? Where's the motivation? They had rewards they were going after not for their own benefit and blessing, but to bring eternal praise and glory to God. And I encourage you to re-engage where there is indifference. Look for it and ask God to root it out of your heart. Second, number two, may we not just look for indifference, but also for incentives. Would you go now to Ephesians chapter 6? God gives us some incentives in His Word that I believe providentially He knows we need to keep us going and to keep us passionate for Him with a hearty motivation in our stewardship. And we find a few verses here that are precious to us in this area of incentive. If you are a businessman, uh, I know especially some of those in sales that are in here tonight, um, you know the value of incentives, right? Um, I know Brother Allen manages his own businesses and several others of you work in administrative positions where you're, at least your employer has an incentive plan, right? Certain things that if you achieve certain markers, and, and those things provide healthy uh, motivation. Uh, school children in the room, you know, I, I, some of it has waned, but you know, I think still some of our kids get grades, you know, it's not just an S for satisfactory or a G for grade or whatever, you know, there's still A through F. Man, F was a motivation to me, you know, not to uh, bring one of those home to dad and mom. And, and there's, there's incentives packed into everything we do in life. But for some reason, when it comes to Christianity, It's almost like that's not spiritual or that's not biblical or that's unproductive and God is is, uh, inclined to instruct us otherwise. So there are tangible uh, motivations that God gives. They're not just secular. They're not just carnal. They're not just unspiritual. Uh, They're things that God has given us. And I gave you two things that we ought to respond to the incentives. We'll get to the Ephesians 6 in a moment. First of all, number one, we should respond to them with humility. The fact that God has promised us rewards should be something we respond to with humility. And here's the truth tonight. I believe we flatter ourselves and we insult God when we say, God, no, I don't want those rewards. I'm not going to even pretend I'm trying to achieve those rewards. When God says, this is what I want to give you. This is what I want to bless you with. And I believe much of the pushback against the rewards that the early saints had no problem striving for, the early Christians, it's our pride. I'm just doing it for Jesus, you know, and and we make a big show about that, don't we? It's pride, it's arrogance. May we humbly receive the gifts and rewards that God entrusts to us. And here's the incredible fact, the discussion or debate about whether we should strive and steward for God's rewards is Satan didn't come up with the idea, did he? We didn't come up with the idea, God did. And God knows we need incentives and God has provided that for us. Let it be a part of your walk in relationship with the Lord. I've had God give me things, and it wasn't just for me. It changed my view of God. I love Him today. My wife is a perfect example of that. I think you all know I married up, to say the least, and I'm grateful for that. That's a gift from God. And I'm thankful that I was faithful, and with the guidance of those in my I was faithful to Him and tried to be prepared for that moment when God brought that person into my life. God has so many things He wants to give you tonight. Don't be arrogant enough to miss it. Don't hold out for, well, I'm just going to do my thing my way and now and then give God his nod. Let God reward you. Let God bless you. 
do so with humility. Someone said this, money becomes a substitute for God because it promises to do for us what he wants to do for us. I'm just going to do my own thing, earn my own living. What about letting God provide for you as only he can? Don't allow your pseudo-spiritual humility, which is really pride, by the way, to ultimately hinder your eternal rewards. Now let's look at these verses. Look at Ephesians 6 there in verse 6. Paul obviously was dealing with, I mean, just tremendous variety in the early churches. I mean, think about you had not just political enemies in the churches that prior to that, you know, were unsaved and then they're lumped in. You also had slaves and masters. I mean, imagine the dynamics and the cult, Jew and Gentile, and just the hybrid conglomeration of people packed into those seats and into those rooms. And he says this in verse 6, not with eye service, as men, <laughs> men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will, doing service as the Lord and not to men, knowing this, knowing, notice verse 8, that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Second, number two, may we respond to God's incentives with hope. Hope that we can receive, hope that we can benefit from what God provides for us. There was a story the other day, I don't know if it reached national news just because of the Olympics, but there was a little boy, 10 years old, living in Norway. This little Norwegian boy, I don't know if you saw the story or not. But he got in mom and dad's car and took off with his little sister in the back seat going to grandma and grandpa's, which was like 20 kilometers away. Well, I can't do the math in my head, but a little distance. And they had had some bad weather, and so I forget his name, but this little 10-year-old driving his mom's car crashed it into a, a ditch, and the snowplow guy went by and saw him and called it in, and they came and rescued this kid. What was interesting about the story was not that. It's what he said when they walked up to the door. You got Junior there, you know, sitting just barely looking over the window of the door, and he told the, the police officer in Norwegian, I guess is what they speak, he said he was a dwarf. That was his story, you know, I'm, and that, that was his way of trying to get out of the situation, talk his way out of it. Kids, I'm not trying to give you ideas tonight, but he, he, that was his story, and he was, trying to, he was trying basically to project that he was older than he was. Do you know many of us, we're not real forward-leaning in how we manage and how we do what we do. Stewardship is always looking ahead. Stewardship is always decided based upon not what's behind and not just what is, but what is to come. And you notice here in verses 6 and 7, first of all, that he reminds these servants to remember who they are serving. Uh, in verse 6 and 7, he says, in verse 7 specifically, with goodwill doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Our hope is not in men. Our hope is not just in the flesh. Our hope is in God. I was coming in today to church, and there's a church up our way in Creston that's having a, uh, I know of the pastor, in fact, he lives just down the street from us, uh, retiring from a church there in Creston, He'd been there a long time, and they had on the sign um, a farewell reception for pastor so-and-so, and, -so, and then it was, I think it's next week. And as I was driving by, I was thinking, the guy's probably about 30 years my senior, and I was thinking, I hope someday that wherever I last served, that they actually want to throw a reception for me. Not as in, who we're glad he's leaving, but we're so thankful for him and the testimony ministry that he's had. But you know, whether that happens or not for any of us, we're not ultimately doing it for man. We're doing it for God. To me, there's great hope in that because he's not going to miss it. He's not going to forget it. He's not going to underappreciate it. He's going to reward it. And so remember tonight who you serve and give and sacrifice because of who he is. Then you notice in verse 8, he goes on to say, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, all right, no matter what it is, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. Not only remember who you are serving, but remember why you're serving. This morning we had in our service, I don't know if you met her or not, but uh, Miss Sheena uh, Holcomb just recently got married and had the privilege of marrying them and um, she's been working a lot of overtime, but she was able to be here today, and her grandmother came today. I don't know if you met her or not, but uh, I had the privilege of doing uh, Sheena's uh, grandfather's funeral, which this was his widow that was here today. I would say with almost absolute certainty she's unsaved. But that was a couple months ago, and we had some spiritual conversation. Brother Slego went with me to the house prior, just prior to her husband passing, and uh, just different statements she made, my guess would be she's unsaved. 
But it was just so neat today to see God, I believe, my prayer is shortly to bring fruit from just the little bit of interaction I've had with her. Just planting a little seed of thought, giving her a couple words of scripture, let her know we care for her. I kept telling her, our church is praying for you. And she said today she would be back and she enjoyed it. And as you know, this morning was not the most positive, you know, God loves you message. And she still was appreciative and thankful for how God has spoken. Can I encourage you why we're serving is the fact that God will take the little we do. I mean, let's be honest, we do nothing, do we? And yet God, the great God of heaven can take that little and he can multiply that, he can bless that and give us great fruit. Look at the fruit God has produced through the life of Miss Joanne. We celebrated that this last week. And just to hear people I'd never met before, they've been their friends for 60, 70 years. Folks saved through their testimony and influence. God can take little and do much. Don't forget that. And let's be faithful to serve God and to do so with hope, expecting that God will bless. Galatians 6, 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. This, maybe this doesn't strike you like it does me, but this is challenging to me when I'm tempted to quit. Someone said this, if you're tired of starting over, stop giving up. A lot of us were a series of starts, and then we quit, and then we start something else. Just stay with what God has laid upon your heart, what God has entrusted to you, and do it. And expect and hope that God will give a reward in His time and in His way. So first of all, we give... And I hope you give tonight with a hearty motivation. God wants your heart connected when you give to Him. Second, number two, we also give with a heavenly motivation. With a heavenly motivation. Would you go over to the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 12? And we're going to look at a couple of verses toward the end of that chapter. Luke, chapter 12, <coughs> excuse me, beginning in verse number 41. Luke 12 and verse 41. I'm sure you Sunday school teachers have some interesting conversations with your children. I have worked with youth and kids through the years, and just the interesting perspective they provide. I heard the other day of a Sunday school teacher who was telling the story of, rich man, of the rich man and Lazarus. I don't know if you remember the story or not. And the teacher said that Lazarus sat outside the rich man's gate covered with sores and begging for food. Uh, and that the rich man, all right, so Lazarus is outside, he's begging, he has the sores, and then the rich man passed Lazarus without even seeing him, but he had wealth and he had comfort. Teacher went on to say, when they both died, Lazarus went to heaven, the rich man found himself in hell, which the teacher described that very graphically and tried to get the attention and heart of her children. When she finished, she asked the kids, she said, quote, now which would you rather be, the rich man or Lazarus? There was a big pause, and finally one little young buck in the back, he said this. He said, I would like to be the rich man until I die, and then Lazarus afterwards. We, we, don't, we, don't we want it both ways? We talked about that a little bit this morning. You know, I want this in this life, but then I want, you know, what God has after this. The, the, you can't have it both ways. And I think we all understand that. But if we're honest, we kind of sometimes have the same view this young man had. God has created us with desires. He's built us to be motivated by those desires, and those desires will ultimately be fulfilled in the context of heaven. Now, if you would, look at these verses here in Luke chapter 12. Let's begin in verse 41. All right, Luke 12, and if you would please, verse 41. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speakest thou this parable unto us, or even unto all? So if we don't have time to look at it, but he goes through this story and these servants and the Lord leaving for a while and then coming back. In verse 42, and the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom the Lord maketh ruler, uh, shall make ruler over his household to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom, when his Lord, uh, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. And what I want to do is very quickly give you the three things that we most crave and challenge you not to find that satisfaction or find that desire to be fulfilled in this world, but to let God fulfill that. Um, God, we talked about this this morning, has made us desirous beings. I think sometimes we feel bad that we want certain things. And I think in some ways that just makes our sinful desires go underground, fulfilling them in a sinful way. God has made us and, and caused us to desire certain things, and they would include pleasure and possessions and power and 
God uh, appeals to those desires to motivate us. But can I say also the devil knows that. Uh, the, we talked about the 1 John 2.15, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. You go through the temptation of Eve and you see them. You go through the temptation of Jesus Christ and you see them again. Satan came to those two individuals with the same tactics and he does the same to us today. And what he does is he tries to convince us God doesn't want you to have pleasure. He doesn't want you to have possessions and power. So come to me and I will give you the things that God's holding out on. And that is the most anti-biblical, unbiblically based perspective of God known. God wants to fulfill. God wants to satisfy. God wants to give you joy and pleasure and all the things that we so crave. But we must come to God. And so I give you very quickly three things tonight that we should look to God for. First of all, number one is we just read, look for, look up for power. Here in this verse, in these verses, he says, if we're faithful, that God will make us ruler. God will make us ruler. Any of the guys in the room realizing your power is waning? Maybe you tried to pull a push-up off lately with your kids watching and your wife, and they're laughing. You're breathing heavy, but they're really breathing heavy because they're laughing at you. Try to do a sit-up, you know, and your, your whole body's shaking. Or you, do you get that like I do? You know, you try to, man, it's just, it, not that it's ever really been there, but it's really not there now. You know, you just, there's no power left. Where's the power? The power is in God. He's all-powerful. Last time I checked, every powerful person on the planet has faded off the view. Uh, you know, I, we were trying to remember some of the presidents the other day going home, and I can remember, I think, four or five off the top of my head. Powerful men in their day. God is all-powerful. He transcends the power of this world. If we want power tonight, may we invest in what God is doing. As we do so, He will bless us. We just sang about it a few minutes ago, but what is God going to set up someday on planet Earth for a thousand years? It is called a what? A kingdom. And in a kingdom, there's authority and there's rulership, and we have a place in that as we're faithful proportionally to the Lord. God will give us a position of power. And may I just give you tonight in each of these areas how you can tap into that power, right? Can I give you three words as you're jotting these down? Under looking up for power, how do we get the power of God? One word, prayer. Jot that down, prayer. Ask God to give you His power and say, God, I want your power to do your will. I want your power to steward these things and these lives and these opportunities to please you. See, prayer is denying our own power in order to gain the power of God. You can't try to make life work on your own and be filled with prayer. Prayer is, God, I can't do this, I need you. And as we yield to Him in moments of prayer, now we possess and now we experience the power of God. I know pastors and I know church people and I know deacons and good, solid Christians that are prayerless people. May we invest more of our time in prayer and less in our own effort and agenda. Second, number two, go to Matthew 6, if you would, please. And verse 19. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19. As you're finding your spot there, by the way, someone said this, where riches hold the dominion of the heart, God has lost His authority. We have to choose to serve God or mammon. We can't have both. And where we have given in to the dominion of riches and our own pursuits, God has lost His authority. May we let Him be in control and give us His power. Matthew 6, and if you would please, verse 19. And again, we won't break down these verses at great length, but just notice an overarching theme of these verses. Verse 19, Matthew 6, 19, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. All right? Next time some Christian tells you it's unspiritual to want treasure in heaven, take them to these verses and the multitude of others that we've looked at in our series here on Sunday nights. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Notice, here's why God wants that. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Second, number two, not only we look up for power, but number two, we ought to look up for possession. For possession. If I were to ask you tonight, what is pastor's favorite car? Um, most of you probably know this. I love Corvettes. I mean, I love them. Some of you, a couple of you have them. And uh, if you ever get tired of them, just let me know. And I'll find somebody to help you with that. But anyway, I enjoy Corvettes. I, right now, I do not drive a Corvette. 
I drive a 2001 Buick Regal that almost broke down three times this week. But I, I, I'm, I'm working at it, all right? It's, it's a GM vehicle. We'll work our way up the ladder is my agenda right now. I don't know if you saw the story, but this past week in Bowling Green, Ohio, did you see the story? Corvette Museum is there. In their main display room, they had a huge cavity, that, uh, like a, a sinkhole that just literally just sucked up. I think it was six Corvettes. Four of them were owned by the museum, I think, and then two were on loan from GM. And they just, I mean, destroyed these cars. And there were several others in the showroom. They were able to kind of get out very quickly. But just, whom sucked them down in, destroyed them. Do you know how quickly the possessions of this life can be gone? Man, I'm amazed how quickly a new thing becomes a broken thing and a discarded thing. We're talking about possessions. Remember we talked about this a couple weeks ago? Not only do we get them in eternity, but they are eternal possessions. They never wear out. They never wane uh, cold or uh, boring or whatever the case may be. They continue, they continue, they continue. So may we look up for that which we want to possess. Selfishness is when we pursue gain at the expense of others. But may I remind you, God does not have limited numbers of possessions. When he gives something to you, he's still got enough for other people. And it's, it, there's just a joy. There's a, there's a multitude of things that God wants to give. So may we serve others and serve God that we might receive those possessions. Number two, all right, so we talked about prayer is the answer or praying is how we get God's power. Here on the second one, jot this down, giving. Giving. Now, isn't that counterintuitive? And we pastors love this principle, right? We love offerings and giving and sacrificing and all that, but we all ought to. It's the means to receiving God's possessions. Giving is the denying of the possession of riches in this life many times to gain the possessions that God promises. I heard a story of a pastor who had a young couple come into his office and very sincere, I mean, good family, wanted to honor and please the Lord with what they had. And they told him they wanted to be able to give more money to the, uh, to the church and the missions, but they couldn't if they wanted to keep saving for their dream house. They said, quote, we've always had this dream for a beautiful house in the country and we can't seem to shake it. Is that wrong, they asked. Pastor told him he thought their dream of a perfect home was from God. And then he said, it's just that your dream may not be fulfilled until heaven. See, we we view our dreams and we view our vision only till the moment of death and much of what God has laid upon our heart and desires are things he will fulfill someday in eternity. Giving is denying the possessions of riches in this life that we might gain the possessions of God and that which is to come. So tonight, if you want possessions, give. Number one, if you want power, pray. Thirdly, go if you would to Psalm 16. And tonight I give you a couple of truths here. Psalm 16, and if you will, verse 11. Psalm 16, and if you would please, verse 11. And number three, not only should we look up for power, not only should we look up for possession, but number three, we should look up for pleasure. For pleasure. You want to be motivated tonight for God? Look up and see the pleasure that he offers you. Here in Psalm 16, notice he says this, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I went home today from church, and uh, kind of the way we work our Sundays is usually we have fellowship and responsibilities after church, and so my in-laws will run our boys home, and we usually share lunch together before they head back to Cleveland. So they were home. We were here for a few minutes buttoning up some things, and we got home, and I walk in, and my mother-in-law is doing what she normally does. She kind of gets whatever food Heidi has ready, just warmed or prepped or whatever, and I look out in our backyard, and my father-in-law is out on a trampoline that I just got the boys for Christmas. He's out, I mean, he's on the trampoline, and he's got on, you know what Crocs are? But like the ones that have like, uh, he'll love me telling this story, but the, you know, where there's, there's a heel missing, but they're pretty enclosed, but there's holes in them, no traction whatsoever. They're just plastic, you know, kind of plastic, and especially in the cold. And he's out there slipping and sliding, and he's got this broom. And my wife had said something this morning when he got there that she was kind of concerned. There was a lot of snow kind of packed on it, and you could see it starting to bow, and her bum husband hadn't done anything about it yet. So he was out there when I got there. 
And so he and I are out there, and it had, I kid you not, just because of kind of the, the we had a couple warm-ups, there was about, maybe I'm exaggerating a little bit, but there's probably at least four to five inches of hard ice that, that it just melted and then, you know, new snow and then that melted. And so just, I mean, thick ice. And it was one huge piece. And he's out there bent over like trying to break it up. You know, he's bouncing in this snow and ice is spraying everywhere. So I went out there, you know, felt bad after that. And we got it all broken up and cleared off. But in the middle of that trampoline is a circle that's about, uh, that's on the matting. That's probably maybe, I don't know, three feet or so wide, maybe four feet wide. And it's what you call the sweet spot. The sweet spot on a trampoline where if you hit that or if you're the one in that spot and someone else is outside of that spot and they launch you just right, I mean, you know, ice or not, you would go flying. You know, the thing just, I mean, that's the place you want to be. My wife and I, back when we weren't old and out of shape, at least as much as we are now, we would play tennis a lot. Uh, back when we were courting and dating and so we would... I remember doing that, and, uh, and, and there's places on the racket you want to hit the ball, and there are places you don't want to hit the ball. There's the sweet spot where you get the most bounce. Do you know when it comes to heaven when we get there? Are you, do you really think we're going to look back? Man, I wish I could go back to, I don't know, whatever you have in this life that's your special chair or your special car or your special store or whatever thing you love. That's the sweet spot. That's the place where we get pleasure forevermore. So we ought to start planning for it and preparing for it and making sure that in that moment we're able to enjoy all that God has promised. Unlike the sensual wanderer that we studied this morning, we can step forward with clarity and confidence toward a place of pleasure that will not disappoint. Heaven's not going to under-deliver. It's not enter into our minds or our hearts the things God has prepared for them that love Him just to even begin to think about the description of that place motivates me. And I can't even understand it. I can't even see it and fully absorb it, and yet it drives me, it fuels me. May it do it the same for you tonight. Here in this one, I would give you this, and this is, this is going to be a challenge. Some of you have never done this before. But number three, if you want the pleasure of God in this life and you want to prepare for it, here's the word, fasting. Fasting. You want to look up for power, pray. You want to look up for possessions, give. You want to look up for pleasure, fast. When's the last time you've given up something for God? We're not talking about Lent or some of the things out there in our culture and even in religious circles. We're talking about genuine fasting. No one knows about it, but we gave up something for the Lord. Um, Things like special offerings in church. I think it's good to give up something no one else even knows about just to have a part in that. Maybe in ministry, you do something extra, and they don't even know where that time or that resource came from, but you gave it. And God sees that. Fasting. Maybe it is food. Maybe it is something in your life you can give up for a time. But fasting is denying ourselves the pleasure of eating or the pleasure of consuming or enjoying in order that we might gain the pleasure that is found only in God. And I'd encourage you tonight to look, instead of looking down or just looking out, look up and receive these blessings from God. Now, if you will, go back to Hebrews 11, and we'll finish here tonight. Hebrews 11 again. And as Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, I'm not after your time, your money, your talents. I just want you to receive the rewards that God has promised you. The means to it is the resources He's entrusted to you. Hebrews chapter 11, and if you would please look at verse 6. We read this verse to begin with, and we'll end with it again tonight. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now here's the word I want you to notice that you may not have noticed when you first read this. But without faith, it is impossible to, what's the next word? Please, and what's the next word? Him. We're not talking about ultimately that rewards is just for us. I believe on that day, listen to me, I believe God wants to reward us. He will take pleasure in our pleasure in that moment. And I think God knows what He wants, doesn't He? And I want God to be able to do in that day when I stand before Him everything He wants to do and everything He desires to do because I did what I was supposed to do in this life. It's not just that I want the rewards, it's that God wants me to receive those rewards. 
and it pleases Him, and it honors Him, and it brings Him glory as He awards and as He rewards faithfulness to Him. I read this quote at the funeral for Miss Joanne, and I read it again tonight. A quote by C.S. Lewis, he said this, The New Testament has lots to say about self-denial, but not about self-denial as an end in itself. We are told to deny ourselves and to take up our cross in order that we may follow Christ. And nearly every description of what we shall ultimately find, if we do so, contains an appeal to our desire. Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of rewards and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, notice, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling with drink and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who goes on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what it means by an offer of a holiday at the sea. And then he said this, we are far too easily pleased. Do you really think this life is going to satisfy the deep cravings of your soul and your family and your life? No, God knows us. He made us. He knows exactly what fulfills us and satisfies us. And he offers that reality to us. See, I'm, I'm of the mindset, and I think the Bible clearly teaches that God will reward every little child that gives to a missionary every mama that takes care of her family, every dad who does right by his family, the man who tenderly cares for his wife with Alzheimer's, the mother who raises a child with cerebral palsy, the unskilled man who's faithful, the skilled person who's meek and servant-hearted. The list goes on and on and on. God rewards specific things, and if you don't do those things or be those things, you will not receive those rewards. And I can't believe that we got to break it down like that for ourselves, but there's so much teaching out there to the contrary. God says, if you do this, you'll receive. If you don't, you'll suffer loss. I'm thankful God warns us and prepares us for that. The question tonight is this, will you allow God to expand your faithful stewardship with hearty motivation? And secondly, number two, with heavenly motivation. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for your word.